So often we've made the story of Noah a child's story and we forget that there is, uh, there is a wonderful thing in it for children, uh, but there is much behind it that is very adult, very applicable for our lives, uh, and a very sad point in human history as well when we read in Genesis 6 that God had to destroy a whole world because of their sin. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Um, any editor that I know of would go through that verse and say, oh, too many extra words. But that's what he's trying to tell us. It was only evil continually, every part of it. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. That brings up enough questions in and of itself. But uh, dealing with God's sorrow about it, he was grieved in his heart and said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, it's one of those verses that I'm very uh, thankful for a conjunction. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, it's the same thing in the New Testament, Romans chapter 3, when it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but... And that conjunction gives us the good news. But the... the uh, Free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So be glad for conjunctions, even though we may have had trouble with them in school. We have a little, little contest here. See how long you can do it. First service did pretty well. Okay, we're going to have a little holding your breath contest. Don't go until I tell you. Okay. Paramedics, stand alongside so we're ready here. Okay, ready? Go. And what did you do at church today? Oh, we held our breath the whole time. Good, your preacher didn't have to preach, did he? No, we just held our breath. Ah, I heard one out. Okay, everybody give up. The real question this morning, see, is not so much uh, holding the breath back then, but when you think about it, if you were back during the days of Noah, would you have held your breath because of the rising water or would you have been holding your breath because of the smell of the animals? See, there is a big contrast here between those who were outside of the ark and they're holding their breath because the rains are coming and there is no dry land any longer. Or would you be one of those who, because of your righteous living, and you would be holding your breath because of the smell of the animals. There's a real decisive contrast here. It would be real easy for us to miss it this morning because we're looking at facts about how in the world could there be a universal flood. But I don't want you to uh, miss the very personal thing, and that is our relationship to God. I want to talk about two facts. They're just simply two facts that you have to keep in mind of what the Bible says. Um, and the Bible makes it very clear about these two facts. The first one is, the Bible says the flood covered the entire earth. You can see it in Genesis chapter 7, verse 19. It says the water prevailed more and more above, uh, upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. Now I want you to notice two phrases here. Because Moses, as he wrote this, does not want us to miss uh, the facts. Two facts. Notice he wants us to understand it's all the high mountains. I take it that the mountains weren't as high as they are now because it was after the work of the flood that they would have been uh, really eroded and would be even higher. But all the high mountains, unless you think 
He met all of the high mountains in one specific area, a limited flood. He says, no, all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens. You cannot miss his point. Moses wanted us to know when he wrote this that uh, the Noahic flood was the whole world. The second thing you need to understand, and the Bible makes it clear, is that the flood destroyed all air-breathing human beings. Uh, that would not include the fish of the sea. But he says in Genesis 7:22, of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. Those are the two facts we have to contend with. Now, the world does not particularly want to deal with that because the flood was God's judgment upon man and people don't like to talk about judgment. Uh, people tend to think that, uh, well, at least skeptics out there, they tend to portray God as a hateful, wrathful, vengeful God and God's just waiting for people to do the wrong thing so he can smush them under his proverbial thumb. But what bothers me and that tends to be people on the liberal end of things, all of these people who, who rant against God judging people and taking lives, these are the same people who will say, save the whales and kill the babies. That doesn't make sense to me. I'm not sure those kind of people have any right to judge God on what he does with sinful human beings because he does it here. But people do not like dealing with issues of judgment. And so many reject the flood. Peter said that it was true. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. Peter wrote, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice. Oh, and I forgot this, did this in first service. He goes on to say, it escapes their notice that there was a flood at one time in history. There was judgment on the world. The whole world destroyed except for Moses, uh, not Moses, Noah and his family. By the way, if I continue to say Moses, Moses was the one who wrote it down. Noah was the one who went through it. Uh, Peter said, people don't like the story and they will deny that such things are true. But Jesus himself said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So it's something that we cannot overlook and miss out on the fact that judgment is coming again on this world, but not through My a reason. flood. Sorry about that. See what Penn and Teller have to say Meyer is this. partially correct. The Noah thing is probably a mixture of stories about a flood that really happened on the Euphrates River about 125 miles southeast of present-day Baghdad. Every spring, the Euphrates floods. But according to archaeologists, one June, around 2900 BC, there was a six-day storm and the river rose another 22 feet. The river overflowed the levees and a lot of people got killed. One of the survivors was a local Sumerian king named Ziath Sudra. He resourcefully commandeered a commercial barge loaded with merchandise and rode the flood downstream into the Persian Gulf, where he finally ran aground. Thankful to be alive, Ziasudra offered a sacrifice in a hilltop temple. That's it. Big flood, boat full of goods, happy landing on a hilltop. And we have geolog Hmm. But that's not what the Bible teaches. I suspect that Penn and Teller would do better at staying with their comedy. By the way, I couldn't even write down the name of uh, uh, this video because it's that vulgar, but he's, he's trying to sound scientific. And he's trying to say what a lot of people did. Oh yeah, there was a flood, but it was just a little local flood and it's got blown up through history and it really doesn't matter. Yes, it really does matter. And what bothers me is when so-called religious people say, oh, it doesn't matter, the facts don't matter. What matters is the point of the story. 
Well, listen, it does matter. God's word says it was a universal flood and everyone other than Noah and his family were killed. And it is an issue, not so much of all the facts, it is the issue of whether the word of God really is the word of God. And you don't make light of the story, therefore. So, I want to talk this morning for a few moments about why it is important that we believe in a worldwide flood. You want to guess what the number one reason is why we should believe in a worldwide flood? Because the Bible says so. That's exactly it. The Bible explicitly says it was a worldwide flood. Uh, God said it. Somebody said, I believe it. That settles it. I'd like to take their phrase and turn it around a little bit. I think we probably ought to say it this way. Uh, God said it. That settles it. I believe it. The fact that I believe it is not what settles it. The fact that settles it is that God said it. He's the one who brought the flood. He's the one who brought the judgment because of the sin upon man. And I believe, people say, you actually believe those things? Yes. No, they're just metaphorical. No. No, I believe they're just exactly what God said. So, I believe it because God said it, but secondly, I believe it because as I look throughout the history of civilization, there are a lot of civilizations that talked about a worldwide flood. Now, there are some that did talk about a local flood. And uh, our comedian friends there were telling you about that one. I was going to list for you the number of civilizations that talked about a worldwide flood, but man, there were more than I that There were dozens of these, these tales, as they say, all over the world. And most scholars believe there is a truth behind all of the ancient myths. But see, the issue is when it comes to this quote-unquote myth, they want to say that the Bible took its myth from the other myths. No, no, no. I think the Bible tells us the real story. And it really happened with others, but rather than saying God did it, they made it into a whole myth of their gods and how these things came about. But you cannot deny the fact that it is a uh, factual story, or at least with the Bible it's factual, that they have put it in myths all around the word of God, world of God, and so I believe it for that reason. Number three, I think it is a worldwide flood because a local flood could have been avoided. I mean, think about it. If, if a flood is coming, why build an ark? I mean, we know that Noah spent at least 60 or 70 years, he may have spent the entire 120 years building this ark, him and his sons, and then perhaps using uh, other men and women around to help out with it. You don't need to go to all that trouble if it's a local flood. And you certainly don't need to get a zoo together if indeed it's a local flood. In fact, the animals are pretty much smarter than we are before all of the uh, tsunamis. I've seen it on uh, uh, the Weather Channel. Before a, a tornado comes, you see the, the cattle scattering. They have an instinct that says, get out of here. So if it were a local flood, as uh, the comedians tell us, they didn't need to go to all that trouble. But if it was a worldwide flood, a lot of trouble had to be taken, as you can see in the book of Genesis. Number four, I believe that a worldwide flood is very important because there is geological evidence of it. I'm appalled at times when, when people talk about, oh, there's, there's, the geology teaches against this. I don't know about you, but when I go to... Um, Oh, the Grand Canyon, or Carlsbad Caverns, or I was on the Pink Jeep Tour last year up in Sedona. And, and these guys make statements like, well, you know, all of this had occurred over millions and millions of years. And our tour guide on the Pink Jeep Tour, I said, says who? Oh, well, everybody believes that. I don't. And they didn't know what to do with it. I said, where, 
What makes you think that it was millions and millions of years? You've just been told that. Well, the Grand Canyon obviously took millions and millions. No, no, no. Have you never seen what a flood can do? And, and, and how it can... Uh, I had a Grand Canyon in my backyard two or three years ago after one of the uh, monsoons came through. The rushing water can do a lot. And when you see evidence of it all over the world, for instance, these ammonites, there's only two here, but ammonite fossils, these are marine animals, have been found thousands of feet above sea level on some of the highest mountains in the world, like the Himalayas and Nepal. And not only there, but then you have to ask the question, how did we get marine fossils up on some of the highest mountains in the world? Oh, let's see. Uh, people carried them up there and forgot them? No. Um, maybe there was water up there? Yeah. It, it makes sense, but they tend to deny that. Or we have uh, fossils like this next one. And this is just one of them. Fossils of entire rainforests prove a worldwide climactic flood. Now, see, this is the thing. You can have fossils, but when you have an entire fossilized forest and the leaves are still on the trees, that ought to give you a clue. You see, generally, if a tree were to fall in the water, what would happen to the leaves? They would decompose, as they do in my compost pile. Uh, they wouldn't stay around long enough for the mud to come upon them and harden into rock. But this one did. Uh, forests, standing, many of the trees still standing, some of them flattened, but with the leaves still there, and we have the fossils. It also tells us that the climate of the world at one time was far different than it is today. All I'm saying is you look at the, uh, you look at the scientific facts, and you can deny them, but you can't deny the fact that they're there, the clues, the things that people ought to see. Another obvious reason to believe in a worldwide flood is because of the duration of the rain and the flood. As Moses tells us in Genesis chapter 7, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And not only the rain, you've got to remember, it wasn't just the rain that flooded the world. We're told in Genesis chapter 7 verse 11 that the fountains of the deep were broken open. That too, in and of itself, would cause tremendous catastrophe all over the world and change this global system uh, into a world that uh, people certainly would not have recognized had they been able to hold their breath long enough to make it through the flood. The entire flood event lasted more than a year. I think if you put all the numbers together, it was about 370 days. Local floods are over in a much, much shorter time. So just given the duration of the rain and the flood tells us something. Number six, because of the size of the ark. Like I say, you don't need to build a big boat and you don't need to put animals on it if it's a local flood. Let me give you a little size comparison here. A lot of pictures we could go to, but here's the Queen Mary at about 1,200 feet, not quite. And uh, you have the Titanic at about 800 feet. Noah's ark... I see they have it on here a little uh, beyond 500 feet. Uh, most of the sources I look at say about 480, close to 5. But the point is, it was a big boat. Certainly bigger than the Santa Maria, bigger than the Wyoming. It was a large boat. You don't need a large boat for a little flood in a local area. And so the total available floor space, and I get this from... Um, uh, Whitcomb and Morris's book, The Genesis Flood, they say the total available space on the ark would have been over 100,000 square feet, which would be more than uh, the space of 20 standard-sized basketball courts. Or to put it another way, let's look at this picture. Here's a, here's a house, here's the size of the ark, 
Uh, they also say the total cubic volume would have been 1,518,000 cubic feet. That would be equal to the capacity of 569 modern railroad stock cars. Again, you do not need that for a zoo if it's a local flood. But God said, Noah, I'm going to destroy the whole earth. And Noah built a boat big enough to handle it. Also, we think of the number of animals on board. There is a lot of dissension as to the number of animals. And this is where the facts begin to be a little bit difficult to deal with because there are so many people who write so many things. So what I'm going to tell you in just a moment is it's not the facts so much that I want you to see. It is the issue of whether or not you really believe there is a God who can do what he says he did. Here are the facts. How could all the animals fit into the ark? Well, first of all, all the methods of figuring out how God could do it are mere suppositions. And you can read a lot of different things from a lot of different people. But you have to deal with this. The God who made the animals could surely gather them to Noah and care for them during their stay on the ark. I mean, he's the one who does that. What I thought was amazing is that there are even many skeptics now who admit that the number of changes within species and families would really only require Noah to have taken anywhere from 2,000 to 16,000 animals on board. You say, well, it's still a lot of animals. Yes, but think of how he might have done it. I can't prove that he did it, nor can anyone. Most likely, he took young animals. That makes sense to me, that you don't take the largest mature size of an animal if you've got to get them all on board. Uh, thirdly, with the exception of birds, I found this interesting, and that should say every, every type of vertebrate has some form of hibernation. Did you know that? It's not true of the birds, but every vertebrate has some form of hibernation. With some, it's going to sleep, like with the bears and, and many others. With some, it is simply the ability to go long periods of time without food. How did it happen on Noah's Ark? I don't know. I don't know how God did it, but it finally comes down to this, folks. Although a worldwide flood is feasible by natural means, we can never overlook the power of God to make anything happen that he desires. You remember how Mary said, God, I'm a virgin. How can this be? You say, I'm going to give birth to your child. How can this be? And God said, with men, it's impossible. With God, everything's possible. And I know what some people would respond to that. Say, oh, oh, yeah. Okay, so you're going to explain away all the difficulties with the same old supernatural power of God cop out. Uh, yes and no. As I was going through these facts, I could have gone on for another two or three hours and given you fact after fact after fact, which probably would not have done a lot of good because you don't want to sit that long. And also because, folks, it comes down to this. Either you believe that there is a God who can do what he says he does or not. And if you don't believe, there's not a lot I can do to make you believe. Even the Lord Jesus told the story about the rich man and Lazarus, and, and the rich man said, oh, oh, send back someone from the dead to my brothers so that they won't come to this place. And he says, look, they have enough facts already. Let them believe what Moses and the prophets said. If, that, if that's not enough for them, more facts wouldn't help. You know what facts Noah had? He had faith. Word of God says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. 
Folks, faith is not a cop-out. Faith is looking at the evidence that you have for God and believing that indeed He is God. And He's able to do the very things He says He can do. I'd like you to examine your own thoughts about God and your own response to what He has done in the world this morning because all of the other facts won't convince you if your mind's made up. But you do need to understand that as judgment came upon this world once before, it won't happen that way again through flood. But this world, according to Peter, is reserved for fire. When God will bring a cleansing upon this world again, and it all comes down to a very vital issue between you and God. God says He loved you so much that He sent His Son to die for you, to make it possible for you as a, as a person like myself, unclean, always with a mind to do the wrong thing. That's not the sort of person who could live in heaven forever. But Jesus paid the price for my sin and for your sin. And that really is the issue. Worried about a flood? No. Worried about death? You might be if you don't know Jesus. Worried about the end of the world? Yeah, you probably are if you don't know Jesus. But I would suggest this to you this morning. Look at the evidence throughout our world. You have enough to stand before God and say, I believe you. And I believe your son who died for our sins and rose again. That will make all of the difference for you in the life you're living now and in the one to come. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, listen folks, we could sit for hours and talk about lots of facts, but the real fact that you've got to decide is whether or not there's really a time in your life when you trusted Jesus to be your Savior. If that's not true of you, you can make it a fact this morning. You can say, God, I believe you sent your son like you said you did. I believe he died for my sins. And I believe that's enough to pay for what I've done wrong. If you'll do that, God says he will save you forever. Forgive your sins. Father, I pray this morning that if there's one here who has not trusted your son as, as their savior, they might do so. But Father, there are others here who have problems in their lives that just seem to come flooding in upon them. And at times, Lord, it hurts our faith. It weakens us. It makes us wonder if you care about us. And then we see, once again, you are a God who has all things under control. You know what we're going through and you have a purpose for it. And you not only plan it, but you plan it for our good. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for loving us so much. You are a great God and we love you for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray.